Introduction Frequently observed in surgical consultations, inguinal hernias are the specialty of many surgeons, who have a growing understanding of this debilitating pathology. Thus had they described a variety of inguinal hernia said pantaloon hernia. Indeed, we have sometimes encountered this type of hernia in our practices. A brief anatomical reminder of the inguinal region, followed by the summary presentation of the inguinal hernias and the pantaloon hernia will precede the presentation of our pantaloon hernia clinical case. Anatomical Reminders The skeleton involved in the formation of hernias The skeleton of the bony pelvis is made up of four bones which form the pelvic girdle, the sacrum behind, the coccyx below and, laterally, the two iliac bones. Muscles they are represented by the muscles of the anterolateral wall of the abdomen namely, the external oblique, the internal oblique and the transverse muscle. The external oblique muscle. The origin of the external oblique muscle of the abdomen is on the bony part of the dimension C5 to C12. The fibers have a ventral, caudal, and medial course. The termination is done by an aponeurosis. The lateral pillar is inserted on the inguinal ligament and the pubis, the medial pillar is fixed on the pubic symphysis and the crossed pillar will be inserted on the contralateral pubic symphysis. The internal oblique muscle. It begins on the thoracolumbar fascia, the iliac crest, and the lateral half of the inguinal ligament. Its fibers are oriented upwards. It has a cranial termination, C9-C12, a caudal termination which participates in the formation of the joint tendon and a medial termination which participates in the formation of the white line. The transverse muscle of the abdomen. It starts on 1. The dimension C7 C12 and the thoracolumbar fascia. 2. Lumbar vertebrae, costiform process L1 to L4. 3. Iliac, anterior two thirds of the internal lip of the iliac crest and external one third of the femoral arch but also on the anterosuperior iliac spine. It is inserted through an anterior aponeurosis over the entire height of the white line. The inferior fibers, coming from the femoral arch bend and insert themselves on the pubis in front of the rectus femoris, leaving a ring above the femoral arch. The inguinal canal is a small, descending canal, having a downward and inward direction, just above and parallel to the lower half of the inguinal ligament. It begins at the deep and continuous inguinal ring for a distance of about 4 cm, ending at the superficial inguinal ring. The contents of the inguinal canal are, the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve, the spermatic cord in men and the round ligament of the uterus in women. The deep inguinal ring. This is the beginning of the inguinal canal, it sits in the middle of the space between the anterosuperior iliac spine and the pubic symphysis. It is just above the inguinal ligament and lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. It is the beginning of a tubular evagination of the fascia transversalis which forms one of the envelopes of the cord in men or the round ligament of the uterus in women. Superficial inguinal ring. This is the end of the inguinal canal, it is above the pubic tubercle. It is a triangular opening in the aponeurosis of the external oblique, with its apex superolateral and its base formed by the pubic ridge. The two remaining faces, the medial cross and the lateral cross, are attached to the symphysis and pubic tubercle respectively, at the apex of the triangle, the two crosses are held together by crossed fibers which prevent the enlargement of the superficial ring. The superficial annulus is the beginning of the tubular evagination of the external oblique fascia which covers structures crossing the canal and passes through the superficial annulus forming the external spermatic fascia. The walls of the inguinal canal. Front wall. It is formed by the aponeurosis of the external oblique. It is reinforced laterally by the inferior fibers of the internal oblique coming from the lateral one half of the inguinal ligament. This gives additional coverage to the deep inguinal ring, which is a potential point of weakness in the anterior abdominal wall. In addition, as the internal oblique covers the deep inguinal ring, it provides an envelope, cremaster fascia, containing the cremaster muscle, for covering structures crossing the canal. The posterior wall. It is formed by the fascia transversalis which is reinforced in its medial one-third by the conjoined tendon, inguinal falx. 
This tendon is the combined insertion of the transverse and the internal oblique in the pubic crest and in the pectineal line. Like the internal oblique that reinforces the internal inguinal ring, the position of the conjoined tendon behind the superficial ring allows additional support to the anterior abdominal wall. The upper wall. The upper wall is formed by the arched fibers of the transverse and the internal oblique. They pass from their lateral point of origin, from the inguinal ligament to their medial point of attachment such as the conjoined tendon. Bottom wall. It is formed by the medial half of the inguinal ligament, it coils below the free edge of the lower part of the fascia of the external oblique forming a groove through which the contents of the inguinal canal pass. The lacunar ligament strengthens most of the gutter. The spermatic cord. The spermatic cord begins at the deep inguinal ring and is formed by the structures that pass between the abdominopelvic cavity and the testes and the three fascias that surround these structures. Hernia, generality. A hernia is the protrusion of an organ outside of its natural cavity through neoformed orifice. Inguinal hernias. Inguinal hernias develop in the inguinal area and include 1. Indirect inguinal hernias 2. Direct inguinal hernias 3. Femoral hernias Pantaloon hernia Definition A pantaloon hernia, otherwise known as a saddlebag hernia, is a combination of direct and indirect hernia. The hernial sac pushes through both sides of the inferior epigastric vessels. Idiopathogenesis Evidence suggests a multifactorial cause. The indirect variety is congenital, but occurs when the abdominal pressure remains constantly positive, causing dilation of the deep orifice of the inguinal canal, leading to weakness of the posterior wall, which causes the bulging of the hernial sac on both sides of the epigastric artery. The direct variety is acquired and results from the stretching and weakening of the abdominal wall medial to the epigastric artery. Hereditary, hormonal, and environmental factors are cited. This type of hernia can be seen during recurrences if the indirect sac is incompletely ligated and also associated with a small direct hernia. Classification In Gilbert's classification, pantaloon hernia is classified as type 6, while in the Nias classification it is classified as type 3b. Clinical it may present itself as a large inguinoscrotal or direct hernia and as two hernias. Pathology At the level of an inguinal region, two hernial sacs are present on each side of the inferior epigastric vessels, and separated by the posterior wall of the inguinal canal which is collapsed. The two hernias can be contained in one bag or in both bags. Oxford Textbook of Fundamentals of Surgery Complications Intestinal obstruction by strangulation and incarceration. Treatment. Open or laparoscopic methods can be used depending on the case and the expertise of the surgeon. Perhaps best addressed by ligation of the inferior epigastric vessels to convert the indirect and direct components into a single sac, hokey maneuver. The clinical case. Our patient is 47 years old. He presented with a huge enlargement of the inguinal region and the right scrotal sac. The pathology has existed since childhood and has become more pronounced over time and with manual activities in the fields, until it takes on a disabling volume. On examination, the inguinoscrotal mass increases when standing and coughing, but only decreases slightly when lying down. It is associated with intermittent pain. The patient has no history suggestive of chronic cough urinary tract infection, constipation, or diabetes mellitus. The mass is single with an inguinal portion that appears to continue into the scrotal region. The diagnosis of right inguinoscrotal hernia with reduced reducibility, slippage, is made. The patient is proposed for Liechtenstein hernioplasty. During the operation, we come across two distin bags containing the intestines on the outside and the bladder on the side, separated by the epigastric vessels. The posterior inguinal wall is non-existent. The intervention consisted of resection of the outer sac, preservation of the inferior epigastric artery and a Liechtenstein hernioplasty, considering the whole as a single entity. The postoperative is uncomplicated at three months. Discussion it is common to meet in Haiti some adults with large unilateral or bilateral inguinoscrotal hernias, 
associated with direct hernias. This situation is only possible by a combination of genetic, socio-cultural nutritional and occupational factors. The long latency period to finally access treatment can be explained by the forced tolerance of the situation, the financial unavailability to access surgical care in the absence of other therapeutic methods. The worsening of the general condition is due to the size of the lump and episodes of vomiting. Accessibility to elective or emergency operative ease puts an end to the patient's endless suffering. The herniorophy with modified bassini and MCV with pelvis tension, difficult to perform in these exceptional situations and burdened with a high rate of recurrence, are replaced by Liechtenstein hernioplasties or other techniques without tension. Conclusion The pantaloon hernia is a pathological entity in Haitian adults that deserves to be prevented by better accessibility to health care. Its intraoperative recognition requires technical expertise in the repair of large inguinal hernias and the systematic use of a hernia.